Hey everybody, good morning. <clears throat> Y'all doing good today? Hey, I wanna start out and celebrate some wins, which I always like to do. Start every day this way, start every year this way, every service this way, because it's important that you celebrate wins. And the first one is, <clears throat> a little book was released this week that, um, that is a number one bestseller on Amazon. In, in the uh, category of Christian lifestyle or something like that. So I, I took a look, somebody sent it to me, I took a look, my competition were two catechism books. So anyway, thank you all for those of you that have purchased it. I pray that it helps you and encourages you. If you haven't gotten a copy yet, I wanna encourage you to get one. And two weeks from today, we'll have a little signing party. I'd like to jot down a note in your book if you purchase one and sign it and uh, just try to encourage you that way. Second win to celebrate today. I don't know if you know it, but Israel was attacked by 180 ballistic missiles from Iran this week, and none of them landed. So Israel is still safe. Huge win to celebrate. Thank you, Lord, for protecting the Hebrew people in Jesus' name. And then the third win, can we put our hands together and bless all of the volunteers? Everybody who volunteers and serves to make the services happen. God bless you all. On the prayer team, ushering, in the booth, in the village, uh, in the lobby, in the cafe, uh, in children's, in the parking lot. God bless you all. You, ma you make life so much better. So thank you for your faithful service, service to High Ridge Church. You are a winner and you are a win to celebrate. All right, number four, I wanna celebrate the win of today is High Ridge Church 17 year anniversary. So thank you, Lord. So in 17 years, we have sponsored countless missionaries, mission projects, ongoing mission endeavors. We have planted three churches, replanted two churches, and done the best that we can do to push back darkness and extend the light of God. So 17 years, thank you, Lord, for your blessings. All right, now I wanna promo one thing. I would ask for a show of hands on this, but I'm not gonna do it. I wanna promo and encourage every one of you who has not yet registered to vote to do so today because tomorrow is the deadline. And so the deadline to be able to vote in this next upcoming election in November, the deadline is tomorrow. So register to vote today. A survey came out this week that uh, there are 80 million Christian adults, uh, Christ proclaiming adults uh, in the United States and only 40 million registered to vote. So register to vote. All right, and then I'll tell you in weeks coming up how I vote and why I vote the way I do. I'm not gonna tell you who to vote for. I'll tell you what guides the way that I vote to try to encourage you to seek the Lord. All right, let's dig in. We're gonna be in Ephesians chapter one in a minute. And we're gonna continue on in the series, Beyond Belief, Defined by God. And this series is to help you to understand the Defined by God section, who you really are. It's an Identity in Christ series. So if I were to ask you who you were, you give me your name, you probably give me your vocation, but I wanna help you to understand who you are as a child of God. So Pastor Zach and I are teaching this series, trying to help you to see you're created in God's likeness, in his image, you were given God's power, you, you have his power to live by, you've been restored from your sin. Uh, last week I taught in Parker about how the importance of understanding that Jesus is your friend, that'll help your identity to stay strong. And so today, here's the topic today, I am a saint. I wanna teach you on the subject of you being a saint of God. If I were to walk into any of 1,000, 330,000, I think, churches in America, and were to ask this question, how many of you perceive yourself as just a sinner saved by grace? I'm guessing there would be a multitude of people that would lift their hands. Yes, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. But if I were to ask in those same, if I was able to go to all 330,000 churches in the United States, and I were to ask the question, how many of you all see yourself as a saint? I don't think there would be as many hands go up. And so I feel like my assignment today is to help turn the tide on that and get you thinking the way I believe God wants you to think about yourself in regards to the concept of sin and being a saint. So let me just show you this in a question. Are you just a sinner saved by grace or are you a saint who is no longer obligated to sin? Now leave that up because I wanna explain this. That, that question is in present tense. So I'm asking you who you are now. 
And notice I, I highlighted the adverbial there, uh, the adverb there, just. That could just as easily uh, read this way. Are you simply a sinner? Say, are you absolutely just a sinner saved by grace? And I wanna help you today to see that you're not. Now, if you're here and you know Christ, then you have been saved by his grace. You, you're, you are free from the bondage of sin. But all too often, we live our life with a focus on sin, even trying not to sin, and we miss the whole point of who we, who we are in God, the fact that he has made us to live, to think, and to be like a saint. So I wanna dig in and show you that out of Ephesians chapter one. Before we get there, I wanna tell you a funny story that kind of makes this point. A minister dies and is waiting in line at the pearly gates to enter heaven. Ahead of him is a guy dressed in sunglasses, a loud shirt, a leather jacket and jeans. St. Peter addresses this guy in front of the minister. Who are you so that I know whether to admit you into God's kingdom? The guy replies, I'm Joe Cohen, taxi driver in New York City. St. Peter consults his list and he smiles as he sees the taxi drivers on the list. He then gives him a silk robe and a golden staff and says, enter into heaven. The taxi driver goes walking in with his silk robe and his golden staff, and then the pastor steps up, the minister. Who are you? He says, I am Joseph Snow, pastor of Calvary Church for the last 43 years. St. Peter consults his list. He says to the minister, take this cotton robe and this wooden staff and enter into the kingdom of heaven. Just a minute, the minister says, that man was a taxi driver and he gets a silk robe and a golden staff. How can this be? He's not a saint. I'm a saint. I was a preacher. Well, Peter says, up here, we work by results. While you preached, people slept, but while he drove, people prayed. <laughs> Let's just take a look at this thought. How did the Apostle Paul address the letters that he wrote to churches in the area where the church had expanded? Particularly, we're going to be in Ephesians today. Still, still, even though an ancient city, still a modern city called Ephus in the southern part of Turkey, which, by the way, let me throw out a plug. I didn't put this in as a promo, uh, but Lord willing, if we have 40 people sign up, we're going to take a tour uh, spring break of 2025, and I know it's short notice, but we're going to take a tour with The Bible Comes to Life my friend in Israel, uh, just look up The Bible Comes to Life. He posts every day uh, stuff that's going on in Israel and, and encourages us as Christians on how to pray. But we're gonna take a tour of the seven churches in Revelation. Now, in the book of Revelation, there are seven churches listed, and all seven cities are still uh, around today. However, Thyatira, one of the seven, was pretty much destroyed by, by an earthquake uh, back in time. But we'll see the six remaining cities and the church is in those cities. And then we'll go out to the Isle of Patmos, which is where John was banished after having been uh, um, boiled in oil to try to kill him after having been stoned with rocks <laughs> and still didn't die. And then they banished him on a deserted island. And so we'll be able to go there as well. But anyway, in the writing of the letters, the apostle Paul never said to the sinners, in such and such a church. In a matter of fact, every single time he said to the saints in Corinth, Rome, Ephesus, to the saints. Take a look with me as we dig into a couple verses here. A saint is a holy one who is set apart for God's purposes. Now, you might have been a sinner, but at the moment that you trusted Christ to come into your life and to forgive all of your sins, even those you haven't yet committed, your whole identity and your whole destiny changed. You're no longer a part of the kingdom of darkness. Somebody say that's right. You're now a part of the kingdom of light, the kingdom of the beloved son, which means you're no longer just a sinner. You don't have to be active in sin anymore. You're a saint. And I wanna show you that with the scriptures today. Look at this out of Psalm 16, verse three. Well, let me read it to you. It says this, as for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. Daniel 7, verse 18. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever. Amen. In Romans chapter 1, verse 7, to those called to be saints. Now I'm looking on the face today of people called to be saints. 
Called by whom? By God, the one who loves you more than any other, the one who wants to bless your life with abundance, with joy, fill you full of faith. The one who wants to bless your life calls you a saint, he doesn't call you a sinner. He calls you one who has been set apart and made holy, as, as the Bible says in Romans. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. See, tragically, many Christians live their lives as though those passages might read like this. To those in the church who are struggling to be sanctified, sinners by calling, saints maybe by hard work, those who live their lives trying to make sure the goods outweigh the bads. Well, friend, let me tell you, that's not a blessed way to live. Why? Because when God saved you from your sins, he gave you a new identity. You're no longer identified by your sin. You're identified by his grace. And in that, your whole mindset should be changing toward the way God wants you to think. Full of life, full of love, able to recognize the holiness of God and to give thanks for it, not run away from it. That's what it means to be a saint. Many, many times people live their lives thinking about not gonna sin, not gonna sin, not gonna sin. And then what happens? Well, when the focus is a negative vision or a negative focus, I'm not going to. That's what I would call a negative vision or a negative focus. Guess where your focus is? It's on the sin. But the way God wants you to live is I'm blessed by God. I'm called, I'm saved, I'm redeemed, I'm one of his children. I'm made to be holy. God has put his holiness within me. And I don't have to live in sin any longer. I don't have to commit them. I'm not bound to them. I get to live according to the ways that my God has for me. That's the mindset God wants us to live with. I'm not saying you won't sin. I'm not saying you won't make mistakes. I'm saying as long as you're thinking about trying not to, your focus is in the wrong place. And you need to get your focus on who you are and whose you are and how you can think and how you can live according to what God's word says about you. And God's word calls you a saint. Ephesians chapter one, we're gonna see this point to start with. Every child of God is a saint, not a sinner. And you're gonna see six things here related to the fact that you're a saint, called out, set apart, made holy, not by your work, by his work and his love for you. Every child of God is a saint, not a sinner. All right, Ephesians 1, verses 1 through 15. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the, somebody say the next word, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Now, I want you to see the number of times in is in these verses, showing us where our true location is. In Christ Jesus. See, saints are, can be happy under every circumstance. Sinners cannot. Say, so where did you get that? Well, to be full of faith means that you're full of God's goodness. You're confident in him. And when you're confident in God, when you're confident in the goodness of God, when you're confident in the nature of God, the blessings of God, then you're no longer living your life confident in who you are and what you can do. Listen, just by yourself, you don't have the power to win over sin. But with God's life within you, directing your soul, which is your mind, will, and your emotions, then you can have victory over what used to always pull you down. And so as I say, saints can be happy under every circumstance. Why? Because you know, even though that you might make a mistake, you're not a mistake. You're a child of God. And you can live that way. And that keeps you in a place of blessing rather than a place of condemnation. Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. Verse six, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. That means in the body of Christ, the people of God. Look at verse seven. In him we have redemption 
through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. I gotta stop right there and take a praise break. I thank you, God, that you have forgiven me. Somebody say amen. That I'm not bound to my mistakes, that I get to live my life with you. Come on, somebody. We get to live our life according to his riches of grace. We don't have to live according to mistakes. We don't have to be bound to it any longer. The forgiveness of our sins according to the riches of his grace. Verse 11, in him we have obtained an inheritance. In him, verse 13, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Verse 15, for this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and your love toward all the saints. saints. Starts out saying, saints, pay attention. Boom, 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 boom. Here's who you are. Here's who you are. Here's who you are. One, two, three, four, five, six. Now, let this be the case for all the saints. Let it be the case for all the saints. Everybody in this service, everybody joining us online, let it be that we're like this. Saints were saints because they acted with loving kindness whether they felt like it or not. See, when you don't have God in your life, it's hard to be good. It's hard to be kind. It's hard enough with him in your life. Can somebody say that's right? <laughs> but, but when you allow him to come in and take over, everything changes. The way you think, the way you speak, the way you act, the way things that used to have the power to break you down no longer have that power, why? Because we have a good God who wants to bless his kids, including helping us to be holy, which is what it means to be a saint. Helping us to be able to stay out of sin. Why? Because he loves us. So who are you? I hope in just a few moments you can say with me, I'm a saint. I'm not perfect, but I am a saint by calling and by God's design. And that's how I'm gonna live my life. All right, let's take a look at some steps that we can take. Steps you can take to increase your identity as a saint. So here are some steps. As a saint, you can be found faithful. That was the first one. Not fearful. Now look at me. Too many of us are living our lives full of fear. What am I talking about? Fear I'm gonna mess up and God's gonna smash me with a gavel. Because after all, he is a righteous judge. No doubt about it, he is a righteous judge. He's the only one that has the capacity to accurately judge right and wrong. But he loves you as a child. And I've never known of a parent that took a gavel and smacked their child on the head when they made a mistake. No, your first, your first duty as a parent is to help your children to walk in the right way and to live with the right behavior. And that's what your father does for you. He's a loving father. Doesn't mean he doesn't deal with sin, he does. If you'll listen to him, he'll, he'll let you know every time. It might sound like this. Up, ah, hold on, stop. It might sound, well, actually, it's not, gonna be, it's not gonna be a shout. God doesn't shout. Let me correct my, my tone here. Stop it. Whoa, baby, hang on. Hey, bud, hey, bud. How do I know that? Because when you have the Spirit of God within you, he gets to whisper because he's so close. The enemy has to shout because he's so far away. And so if you will just allow him to do so, he will make you faithful, full of faith and not full of fear. Not always wondering, where am I gonna mess up next? What am I gonna do next? You can be full of confidence God gives you to live by faith. So here's number one, ask God to increase your faith. Just make that a prayer. God, would you increase my faith? He just told them they're saints, and as a result of being saints, they are faithful, not faithless, not fearful, faithful. And that's how we can be as well. Amen, somebody? We can live that way and not live in fear. Number two, as a saint, you can receive spiritual blessings. I talked about that in him, spiritual blessings. You can be blessed with spiritual blessings if you, you can't be blessed with spiritual blessings if you aren't a saint. But when you are a saint, then blessings pour out from heaven. The psalmist captured it this way. At your right hand are blessings and pleasures forevermore. He loves, to, he loves to just pour out blessings on your life. The question is, is are you walking with him? Are you loving him? Are you trusting him? 
Are you making the choice to live the way he lived, to follow in his footsteps? If you are, then you can count on the fact over and over and over again, even more times than you'll ever know this side of heaven, there's been a pouring out of blessings from the right hand of the Father on your life because he loves you that much. Listen, God is in your corner. He's not in the enemy's corner. He's coaching and helping you. He's not coaching and helping your enemy. He's already cast your enemy far away. Don't let your enemy get close. So ask God, number two, ask God to help you recognize your blessings, multiplied blessings that God has for every one of his sons and daughters. Multiplied blessings. That's how good our God is. All right, on our way to number three, as a saint, you can live like one who has been chosen. You no longer need to live with rejection in your life. You've been chosen. In him we are chosen, Ephesians chapter one says. And this is the name of, of uh, what we call adoption ministry here at High Ridge. Many years ago, I'll tell you the story, the history behind this. Many years ago, the Lord put the orphans on my heart. Uh, I, think, I think we'd been married seven years and had two kids at that time. And uh, I started traveling with a couple of guys, one Julio and, and, uh, and, and his, his partner, and we started going Esperanza Missions. Hope Missions is what it was called, building orphanages in Mexico. So we'd drive down after work on Thursday night. So guys would take off work on Friday. We'd drive down all night Thursday night, get there, work all day building the orphanage, go out Friday night to villages and show the Jesus movie uh, in Spanish. So we had a businessman buy a big screen. Uh, another businessman bought a commercial projector that would run off a generator. We hauled it down with us every time. We went out and evangelized the villages around where we were building the orphanage. And, and ministering to orphans just touched my heart, just really captured and filled my heart. And God continued to, to bless our family. Our family continued to grow. And we were never really in the place. Dawn was either pregnant or nursing children for I think 14 straight years. We were never in the place where the Lord allowed us to adopt ourselves, but we did everything we could to bless orphans in every way we possibly could with any, any opportunity and with our own money as well to be a blessing to them. And God put that in my heart and it's come into the heart of the High Ridge family. And God has blessed us. And I wanna give you a couple stats here. This is exciting. Thus far, families in High Ridge Church have adopted 53 orphans. Isn't that awesome? And families in the High Ridge family have fostered 59 children. Isn't that awesome, helping kids out? And then hundreds and hundreds of others who have done what we call wraparound, who know of a family who's adopted and they help that family. They run errands, they, they do things to help that family. And the same thing with foster family. Hundreds of people involved in, involved in wraparound care. So when the Bible talks about being chosen, yes, we have that as children of God, but how about we help do it in a practical way in our world? How many of y'all are in super series groups? If so, then you saw this week in the defined video for this week, you saw an explanation about this very thing, about the condition of orphans in the Roman Empire. And here's, here's what I, I researched it to find out, be sure it was true. Adopted children had more rights in the Roman Empire, which is where, uh, where the kingdom of God was expanding at this time. So we're taking a look at, at a city in the Roman Empire, Ephesus, that was in Turkey, completely under Roman rule. So they would have followed these laws. But an adopted child in Ephesus back in biblical times had more rights than a, than a biological child. Roman law stated that you could disown your own children. <laughs> it's funny, first service, a guy went, oh yeah. <laughs> but in Roman history, you couldn't, you couldn't disown adopted children. In other words, if you lived in the Roman Empire and it was huge and you adopted a child and paid and went through the legal proceedings, there was never a getting rid of that child. And that's how it is for us as we are chosen and adopted by Almighty God. He won't get rid of us. He's made it his, his mission to bless us and help us and get us into his family. You, my friend, if you know Jesus, have been chosen by Almighty God. That should do a little something for how you think about your life and about how you believe your true identity really is. So number three, ask God to help you celebrate your adoption. Let's move to number four. As a saint, you can live like one who is of great value because you have been redeemed. In Ephesians chapter one, in him we've been redeemed. What does it mean to be redeemed? To be bought back. To pay for something that, that, that got away from you and you buy it back. 
That's what Jesus did for each one of us that know him as our Lord and Savior. He bought us back. He redeemed us. Why? Because he loves us that much. See, you can gain victory over your thoughts and accusations, and you can gain victory very simply by this thought, understanding, yeah, I made a mistake, but I'm not a mistake, but yeah, I have been redeemed by Almighty God. Listen, the song playing in your mind that might go like this, you're no good, you're no good, you're no good, baby, you're no good. I'm gonna say it again, you're no good, you're no good, you're no good, baby, you're no good. God does not sing that song over you. Never. He says, I love you, I care for you, and if you'll let me, I'll buy you back. I'll purchase, I've already made the payment, now I'll apply it to your life if you will but receive it. And I'll bring you out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, out of the realm of the evil one into the kingdom of my beloved son. Father God will redeem you if you will let him do it. Now, if you're here today and you say, Jeff, I don't know. I don't know if I've been redeemed. I don't, I don't know if I've ever been bought back. Well, friend, we can settle that issue in just a moment. I'll help you connect with God, pray a simple prayer, and at that moment, you can be redeemed. Your whole destiny can change. Your whole identity can change. And you can let Jesus do for you what you can't do for yourself. You can let him forgive your sins, all of them, past, present, and future. You can let him forgive all of them, very simply by receiving him into your life. So number four, ask God to help you see your great value to him. Ask him to help you see how valuable you are to him. All right, let's keep going. As a saint, you have an eternal inheritance waiting for you on the other side. Those who don't know can't receive, but those who know can receive an inheritance. Those who don't know the Lord, your inheritance isn't in heaven. But those who do know the Lord, your inheritance is in heaven. But here's good news. Your inheritance can happen in your life today. You can live a life of inheritance every day of your life because your God loves you that much and wants to bless you. He wants you to understand the fact that in him, you have an inheritance. Without him, you don't. And many times we live our life like we're not really a child of God. We live our life, we live our life thinking I'm just caught in sin, I'm just a sinner but I've got my fire insurance, I've got my fire insurance card right here and I'm not gonna have to pay in hell. Life is so much more yeah. than escaping hell. Yeah. It's living an abundant and blessed life now. Living with God, directing your thoughts now, your actions now. And that's what I pray you grab hold of today. There's an inheritance that can be yours today an inheritance that can be yours over and over and over again. Speaking of inheritance, those that have been around a while have heard this story, but I wanna share it for those that are new. Don's dad got into an affair uh, when Don and her older brother and, and little sister uh, and, and Don's mom had no idea what was going on and he decided on family vacation one year. They're all there on family vacation. His mistress shows up. He decides that that's it. He tells back to Don's mom and the family in the hotel room or in the cabin, I don't love you anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm meeting, I've met this girl. I'm gonna marry her. They didn't hear from him, know anything about him, got the divorce, went on, lived his life, didn't hear a thing. Well, not too long after that, she contracted a terminal disease called Huntington's disease or Huntington's chorea, and, and it's a miserable way to die, and she lost her life to that, his, his second wife. And then shortly following that, her son, his stepson, went and had genetic testing done and found out he had the, the, um, the marker for it and decided he didn't wanna go through the pain that his mom went through and he went to a gun range and killed himself. And this stunned my father-in-law. And then he had a crisis in his life that, that came as a result. He had lost his first family by abandoning them. Now he'd lost his second family through death. And he was heartbroken, desperate, needed some love. And he knew that his middle child, my wife, loved God. He knew that, that her husband loved God. He knew that as best we could, we lived our life without judgment, that we lived our life extending grace, not gracing sin, but gracing sinners to be able to understand the love of God and come back. And he called one day out of the clear blue shortly following the death of his stepson. He was in Oklahoma City driving to DFW. 
He called and said, I'm in Oklahoma. I think I'm close. I'm coming to stay with you. Now, there have been gaps of years of any interaction with him, and he was on his way down. So Don had a few minutes to get the kids ready. They were little. They were all small, of, of Grandpa uh, Cowan coming to visit. I don't even know if some of them even knew him. And uh, so Don briefed our kids on how to respond to Grandpa. They knew their papa really well, my dad, because he was around a lot, did a lot, but they didn't know their grandpa. So she briefed him. When he gets here, we're gonna love him. I want y'all to give him hugs. Uh, he smokes pipes and cigars. He's not gonna smell good. <laughs> His breath is gonna be stinky, but we're gonna love him anyway. Now, I'm joking. But <laughs> and, and so he pulls in the driveway. The kids couldn't wait. They went busting out the door, ran out and mobbed him. Just loved on him because mom had taught them. My, Dawn, their, my wife, their mom, taught them, love your grandpa. And those few days that he was with us, God got a hold of his heart. Nothing to do with us. He was already taking the step to get somewhere where he thought he could get some help and get out of the mess that he was in. And that was coming to connect with us. And God just used us to help bless him, to see him, he needed to come back home because he'd professed Christ earlier in his life. And everything changed. His whole mindset changed. And it wasn't too long after that visit that Don got a phone call one afternoon, Sunday afternoon. I think I was meeting with someone. I didn't get home till like four o'clock. And I come walking in the door and she's sitting on the sofa crying. I think my estrogen might be too high. <laughs> I know men have some, but I think I got too much right now. And she's crying, and she says, you're not gonna believe this. I said, what? Dad's gonna buy us a house. And that was the beginning of the releasing of his inheritance. He bought each of his three kids a house, and then all kinds of other things followed. Boats, I made a list. Cars, guns, <laughs> money. There would be times when, when we would have, you know, we'd have something that was outstanding that we had to cover, we didn't have the money for it, and in the mail would come a check without anything being said. God just put on his heart to release his inheritance to his children. Why? Because it was through his children he was touched by God. And in coming back into a place of love, he understood where his real identity was. Nothing to make us to be perfect, not the point at all. Just understanding we can live our lives in and with the grace of God so the people around us are able to recognize what the blessed life is like. And once he realized that, he started releasing his inheritance because he wanted to bless his kids. And that's the way God is with you all the time. All the time. He's constantly releasing inheritance. The inheritance of blessings that you don't have when you turn your back on God. The inheritance of, of right thinking that you don't have when you walk away from God. The inheritance of joy and peace and strength and everything that is, is, is the right to, to what he gives to his saints. It comes when you make the choice to walk in it. So ask God, number five, to help you see your eternal inheritance. And then here's the last one. As a saint, you are protected, powered by, and filled full of the Holy Spirit. Who is God? Who is good? Who you don't need to be afraid of? Who is not the bronze medalist of the Trinity? The Holy Spirit is fully God. Now, people have made him to be scary, but that's them. They're scary. The Holy Spirit's not scary. The Holy Spirit is God. So you can live a full and dynamic life in the Holy Spirit where you hear his voice, understand the blessings that he gives, understand the, the fruitfulness and the, and the gifts given to your life. You can understand life in the Holy Spirit. That's what I tried to do in the book, The Real You Fully Alive, Spirit, Soul, Body, is to help you to understand the blessed life of living in the Spirit. So number six is ask God to fill you with the Holy Spirit. Ask God to fill you. Say, what is that? Just ask for it. You'll find out afterwards. You might be here today and you say, I don't know that I've ever been filled with the Spirit. I don't know that, that, that I'm completely full with the Spirit of God. Come to one of our prayer team members in just a moment. Say, I'd like to be filled with the Holy Spirit. They'll know how to pray for you. And if you fully believe that God still does what he's always done, then you can be blessed with life in the Holy Spirit starting today. Ask God to fill you with the Holy Spirit. See, the problem is not that the Bible doesn't clearly identify believers as saints. It does. 
The problem is, is that we don't seem to believe the Bible on this topic. We think we're just sinners trudging our way through, trying to be sure the goods outweigh the bads. But life is so much more than that. Life can be abundant in God if you'll just understand who he's made you to be. And he's made you to be a saint. You don't have to sin. You're not bound to it any longer. You can be free from it if you'll just make the choice. You don't have to do what you've always done. You can live and think and do what God has for your life. And friend, I can promise you it's a much better way to live than living underneath the load of guilt and shame. Your focus should be on thinking and speaking and living like a saint, one who is called, one who is chosen, one who is blessed by Almighty God. Go for it, friend. Go for it. And you'll sense that the nearness of God is for your good in that moment. There is no saint without a past and no sinner without a future. The choice is where's your focus? Where's your focus? Are you willing to change your mindset today toward God and turn away from your failures? All right, I wanna pray for us. Would everyone close your eyes and bow your heads? I wanna pray for us today before we go. How many of y'all would say that the Lord has spoken to you today through the time of worship or during the teaching? Could you just lift your hand? You just recognize that the voice of the Lord is speaking to you. Not gonna call you out, not gonna embarrass you. Just wanna see, just wanna see. And just when you lift your hand, it's like you're saying, okay, God, I hear you. I hear you, thank you. Good, God bless you all. Thank you for your honesty and your integrity. Father, bless my friends with lifted hands today. I thank you that they have ears to hear you. I thank you they have a heart to obey you. I thank you, Lord God, that they have the capacity to love you. So bless my friends with lifted hands right now. Bless them, I pray. Do every work that you intend to do in their life to cause their faith to grow. And this I pray in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. All right, you can put your hands down. One more prayer before we go. And this prayer is the one I talked a moment, a moment ago about in the teaching, about meeting Jesus and letting him forgive your sins. So you might be here today and you'd say, Jeff, you know, in all honesty, I'm not positive that at the end of my life, whenever that might be, that I'm gonna be with God in his heaven forever. I've got my doubts. Well, friend, I wanna encourage you to recognize something. You don't need to doubt any longer. Today can be the day where you can solidify and nail down your relationship with God, where you can receive his love into your life. The question is, is will you let him? Now, you might be here and say, you know, Jeff, I'm trying to be good enough. Well, friend, let me just tell you something. Your best efforts to be good enough aren't cutting it. And deep down inside, you know that. And that's why you need a savior. That's why you need Jesus. So if you're here today and you're not absolutely certain that your eternity is gonna be with the creator of the universe forever and ever in heaven, that your eternity is gonna be with Jesus, then I wanna help you eliminate all doubts today by just helping you pray a simple prayer. There's nothing magical about this prayer. It's just a prayer that someone helped me pray one time so I could connect with Jesus. I took him up on it and it worked. And I believe it'll work for you today too. So I'm gonna pray, friend, if you have any questions at all, boy or girl, mom or dad, grandma or grandpa, that doesn't matter. If this is your first time here today, that doesn't matter either. I wanna encourage you to pray with me right now and let Jesus come into your life and let him forgive all of your sins. So here we go, I'll pause after each part of the phrase so that you can, each part of the prayer, so that you can pray it. So here we go, pray after me, Lord Jesus, I'm choosing to trust in you right now. I'm choosing right now to believe that you're God's son and that when you conquered sin and death and came out of the grave victorious, I'm choosing to believe that you did that for me. And I'm asking you right now, Lord, to come into my life, to take over my life and to forgive all of my sins. And Lord, I want you to know, pray this friend, this is very important, pray this. Lord, I want you to know that starting right now, I'm not gonna live my life my way any longer. Starting right now, I'm gonna live the rest of my life with you. And then here's the close of the prayer. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for just now hearing and answering my prayer. And it's in your name that I've prayed. 
Amen. With all heads bowed and all eyes closed, except for those of you who just prayed with me. If you just prayed with me, would you look up at me right now? Would you just look up at me and give me a wave? Just look up at me, wave at me. Yes, 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 yes. Just look up at me and wave at me. Yes, yes. Wave at me until I see you. Yes, yes. Gotcha, yes. Just wave at me until I see you. Yes. Wave at me until I see you. So that's me, Jeff. I just prayed with you. Yes, yes. I'm looking back across. If I miss you, look up at me now. Boy, girl, mom or dad, grandma, grandpa. Yes, got you right there. Yes, yes, got you all right there. Just look, look up at me, wave at me and say, that's me, Jeff, I just prayed with you. Anyone else? Anyone else? Okay, those that just waved at me and looked up at me, would you look back up again? Way to go. I'm so proud of you. You just made the best decision you could ever make. You just made an eternal decision. You just took a step toward God. Now I wanna help you to understand something. You just started the first part of a walk with God by taking a step and letting him take over your life and forgive your sins. The next step is to let that be known openly. And the way that the Bible teaches that is in baptism. We baptize here just like Jesus was baptized. All the way in the water, all the way out, and it's a party, it's a celebration. It's a huge time of, of joy when you're baptized. Now, would you take the green card on the seat pocket in front of you. For those on the front row, it's right on the seat back behind you. The seat you're sitting on has a green card. Would you pull that green card out, put some contact information on it. If you don't have a Bible, bring that card to one of our prayer team members and they will get you a brand new Bible. We want everybody that knows Jesus to have a Bible. If you do, then you can just drop, if you have a Bible, you can drop that card in the wooden box by the door on the way out. But we wanna start today encouraging you. God bless you. Can everyone look this way? Can we celebrate 15? Come on, let's let them know. 15, we're so proud of you. So excited, so excited for you. 